stocks see a sharp surge after a lower than expected US inflation print spurs big risk on bets. IT leads the comeback, followed by metals and realty, while autos and energy lag. Apollo Hospitals delivers a growth surprise, but Aisha Motor sales mix hurts its margins. Jindal Steel and Power ekes out an unexpected forex gain, while Muthut Finance is hit by a loss of customers. Zomato gains as focus on unit economics sets it on path to profitability, while stocks of Nikon Policy Bazaar owners, FSN e-commerce and TB Fintech rise despite a selling overhang. The rupee scales to a seven-week high after a near 2.5% slide in the dollar index overnight. The dollar drop leads to gold clocking its strongest gain that we've seen in eight months. Good afternoon. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. And at the halfway mark, uh, we have uh, the markets doing extremely well. In fact, virtually at the high point of trade with a gain of almost 300 points on the Nifty. The Sensex doing well. It was the Nifty Bank which was underperforming in the first half of trade and now has come back. And that's uh, as a tweet said, because the elephants are dancing. HDFC and HDFC Bank, both of them doing extremely well in today's trading session and contributing to the majority of the gains that we've seen in just the last half an hour or so. Hi, Ekta. Hi, Sonal. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Uh, of course, we have a lot to discuss, but right now, let's do one thing. Let's start the show by focusing on Deepak Nitride. The stock, remember, was down 10% in trade yesterday. It was a weak quarter for the company, led by the Phenolics division. Their Phenolics habit was down 53% on a year-on-year -year and 45% on a sequential basis. We have Mr. Malik Mehta, who is the CEO and ED of the company, joining us now to discuss more on their quarter two performance. Uh, Mr. Mehta, good afternoon. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot for joining us. And specifically wanted to ask about your phenolics division because that has seen a big fall in margins. As I said, EBIT is down both quarter on quarter and on a YY basis. What went wrong here? Um, tell us more about what the macros and the micro specifically for the company looked and the outlook as well. Unfortunately, uh, what I can say is that we have a, a, an over muscular quarter facing off with a relatively weak quarter on a year-on-year -year basis and that makes the difference look even more spectacular. Nonetheless, what I can say is that uh, in quarter two, we had a, a very unique situation, which is not one that normally is seen, where uh, the geopolitical uh, climate in Europe meant that a significant amount of crude all over the world was actually consumed not for uh, as a downstream into the pet chem industry, but as a fuel source for its calorific value. So it was burnt in, uh, in as a replacement fuel for natural gas. And that meant that there was essentially that much less benzene uh, and other pet chems that were made. And whatever was made, therefore, was sold at such a significant premium, while at the same time, phenol, which is largely used as a solvent, uh, you're not going to use a solvent. Uh, you're not going to worry about that when you're still busy trying to heat your house, right? So essentially, you saw the price of uh, you know BTX, the petrochemicals, skyrocket because of a paucity of uh, crude available for cracking, and a drop in the demand for phenol, simply because it became a distant second priority. And this is an abnormal situation. Normally, you will find both of these moving in somewhat of a lockstep, maybe with a month's lag. But today, because of the very, very high price of benzene, uh, in the same quarter, we've seen a high and a low, which was about 50% apart in the same quarter. Uh, but this has resulted in tremendous demand destruction, especially when it comes to styrene monomer and uh, MDI and other polyurethanes for a short period of time, which has led to prices of things like benzene and toluene. Uh, coming down far faster than prices of things like phenol, which were already quite subdued to begin with. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but do you have an outlook in terms of uh, probably the coming quarters, any kind of vis visibility that you have? So you're seeing uh, quarter three, which is at least a little bit better than quarter two. Quarter two had uh, uh, poor demand and supply uh, economics that were there. Nonetheless, all I can say is that whatever we think of as a global slowdown in India, while there was a slowdown, we, we forget that India is a far more interesting growth opportunity than 
the rest of the world. So slow in India is still fast for the rest of the world. So Domestic the consumption was there, slower than normal, more cautious than normal, but it allowed us to manufacture at a rate exceeding 120, 130%, while our nearest neighbors in Korea, Thailand, China, they were operating at rates of 30 and 40%. Right, and as far as your uh, advanced intermediary segment is concerned, that did well. Uh, I mean, uh, base, what about the other segments, basic chemicals, fine or specialty? What did well for you? As of October, yes, it is. Uh, what we had in quarter two was a phased startup, which we believe is the safe way of doing things, prioritizing man and material safety over profitability. Uh, what we saw in terms of uh, strength was, by and large, uh, all of our segments were strong in terms of uh, volume. Now, where there, there were price increases, that was largely on account of significant cost increases that took place, whether it was on uh, caustic, whether that was on ammonia, whether that was, as I mentioned, in relation to benzene, similarly for toluene itself also. So we did see uh, you know, a lot of uh, raw material price movement. Luckily, we were able to, in general, uh, you know, have very understanding customers who were able to accept the price increases. What we did therefore see was, on a percentage basis, a contraction in EBITDA. But uh, we maintained and, in fact, in many cases, grew our wallet share. In India, also, there was a slowdown in the demand in the textile segment where we have a lot of our sodium nitrite and nitrate going. Uh, but we were able to offset this by exporting significant volumes, where earlier they would have used Deepak as a second supplier and Europe as a primary supplier. So we were able to get a uh, you know far larger volumes at about the same times as freight rates were normalizing. So by and large, we were able to protect our gross margin slightly at the expense of our percentages but we are bullish in the overall sense about demand for standalone businesses. Okay, all right. So that is about the advanced intermediates where your India business, of course, is doing better than the global markets. Now let's talk about your CapEx. You have some CapEx lined up. There are three new projects they have been commissioned. One was in October related to agrochemicals, second in November, and third one for the European market. Considering this and the 1,500 crore CapEx that has been lined up and you've spoken of as well, what is the growth target, say, two to three years down the line? Uh, what kind of growth are you penciling in here? As we have already... Uh, mentioned that there's about a 1500 crore which is now going to creep up not because of escalation in production but because we're adding new uh, deep bottleneckings and adding new green fields uh, but that will be in the wholly owned subsidiary Deepak uh, Chemtech and there will be a, both an upstream and a downstream uh, uh, investment there over and above this as I have mentioned in a previous uh, con call I think in Q1 we are working on the engineering packages for about three new uh, products which will use uh, uh, very technically challenging uh, gas liquid uh, chemistries, which will be new investments not yet uh, announced in that quantum either. But we will look at them as being about 20 to 22 percent EBITDA over and above the EBITDA that is already made by the existing businesses, and they'll be downstreams, largely uh, with uh, pharma anchor customers and uh, I mean there will be a mix of domestic as well as international customers in these cases so these will be uh, a good value addition as well maybe housed in the uh, subsidiary maybe housed in the primary companies we'll need to see and finally the third leg of uh, investment will be our first international plant which will be in Oman where we will hold a majority stake where the large raw material consumption will be the same product, which is also used as an energy source, which is natural gas. And we will be using this and uh, the downstream ammonia into making products such as sodium nitrite and nitrate. And largely because we are very familiar with the end consumers, the end customers, we're confident about the growth. We're also confident about our ability to compete with uh, you know, manufacturers, whether they are in Europe or in uh, China. And uh, we have, uh, in Oman at least, 
pipeline, I think a one or a two kilometer pipeline for feedstock uh, ammonia. And then FTA with countries such as the US, where we will see a significant volume going. And in that sense, it will not uh, step on or cannibalize the market share that Deepak Nitrite in India already has. And this will, over a period of time, start off with being uh, you know, a two or a three or a four product site, but will become an integrated site, which will house a lot of other products which have chemistries which we're already familiar with. Okay, sure. I uh, just wanted to touch base on developments globally. Is Europe plus one an opportunity? How would you view it? And uh, for the chemical industry as a whole, and uh, what is your take on the impact for your company specifically? So it's all of the above. There is certainly a short to medium term trend to look at a Europe plus one. We must also keep in mind that uh, the size of the European chemical industry is not to be underestimated. It is massive. And it is, uh, in that sense, it is uh, the chemical industry that the rest of the world's chemical industry actually supports. Nonetheless, owing to uh, high energy feedstock prices right now, a lot of European customers, uh, a lot of European companies are looking at outsourcing part or all of their, uh, you know, targeted uh, production outside of Europe into countries such as India, but not limited to India. However, Europe is also a very large consumer of chemicals, and therein there is also an opportunity. So over a period of time, it is left to be seen whether this is a tactical change or a strategic seismic shift. Today, it looks like a little bit of both, but uh, you know there are a lot of very intelligent people working very hard here. So I think over the next six months, certainly there will be a lot more clarity. It is not the way that one anticipates a China plus one. It is uh, you know, one where they are looking at redistributing the cost base. When it comes to China, they're looking at redistributing the strategic risk. So these are different ways of looking at similar problems. And the European problem is one where the European partner themselves is working with uh, a non-European partner to see how to de-risk their supply chain. Whereas in China, it is the demand actually being shifted away from China by the consumer. Okay, we're going to leave it on that note. It's been a pleasure hearing your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's Deepak Nitrite. Uh, that stock is up around 7 tenths of a percent, so a bit of a recovery that you'd have to see. But uh, I just want to pull up Zydus Life because that's erstwhile Cadilla that released its numbers just a couple of minutes ago. And overall, uh, yes, the margins have been impacted this quarter simply because of, of, of COVID-related inventory. But what seems to be working this quarter in their favor is the U.S. business which is up around 9% on a Q1Q basis, which is aided by new launches. So that is definitely a positive. The company has also said that the India formulation business is up 11% on a year-on-year -year basis, X of COVID-19. So just a couple of points to keep in mind. That's Zydus Life. It's been quite uh, volatile post its numbers, so the street is really negotiating with whether there are more pluses or minuses at this point in time. Take a short break. On the other side, we have our second corporate on the show. We have Ryan which will be discussing their Q2 performance. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, steady state for the markets. The mid-cap index has also picked up a little bit of pace, so up around half odd percent. But no, it is not really IT, which is now the big sector of the day. It is the HDFC twins, which are really stealing the limelight in today's trading session. Just look at the way HDFC and HDFC Bank are rallying. Both of those stocks are at the high point of the day. So what is driving this? CNBC TV18 learns that the MSCI inclusion overhang on HDFC Bank may in fact be lifted. Vivek Iyer is joining in with the details on this story. Vivek, go ahead. Well, that's right. So the impending merger of HDFC Limited with HDFC Bank had led to quite a lot of confusion as to the treatment of the merged entity in the passive indices. So both MSCI, FTSE, and in fact, you know, even in the uh, Nifty or the NSE indices, there was quite a bit of confusion as to how exactly the treatment would occur. When would you know uh, HDFC Limited be removed, and when would the merged entity be, be then put back in? In the case of MSCI passive index, you know, the other confusion was the combined shareholding pattern 
and the foreign headroom within that. So that had also led to a significant amount of selling as far as FIs are concerned in both of these shares. Today, what has happened is the fresh update. MSCI has actually made amendments to the methodology document in the case of treatment of large corporate MAs, and you know HDFC and HDFC Bank clearly falls into this particular category. So what we understand, you know, and uh, quant analysts have been working up, you know, the numbers, and th what they actually make of this is that um, this basically means that the this particular update on the MSCI website means that it now appears as though the merged entity would now not be removed but directly be added and the weightage that you know HDFC actually enjoys in MSCI will actually increase in fact more than double. So this increases the probability of HDFC Bank's inclusion in the MSCI India index and this is the reason why today we are actually seeing such a sharp up move in both HDFC as well as HDFC Bank. Take that point entirely, Vivek. In fact, as we speak, both these counters are at the high point of trade. And uh, this was one of the reasons why, you know, they were underperforming in the past as well. The overhang of some sort of flows going out uh, once this merger was to happen, etc. Now, turns out that, you know, not only is the merger uh, on track, importantly, it is perhaps uh, ahead of schedule as well. And uh, indices are coming together to ensure that there is not much move in terms of uh, the expected weightage and uh, flows uh, moving out of these counters. And a big move is what we're seeing in both these stocks. Uh, let's move on and talk about rights. They reported a weak set of earnings for the second quarter, and that's primarily on account of uh, a big amount of decline that we saw in their export segment, which was perhaps partially offset by their turnkey segment, which saw an over 100% growth. We have with us Rahul Mittal, who's the chairman and managing director of the company, now joining in. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Mittal, for joining in. Let's talk about both these verticals. I mean, uh, exports usually did, what, about 300, 350 crores in terms of a quarterly run rate. That's fallen to about 79 crores. So what's your outlook on that? And turnkey, now it's doubled from last year, a high margin business for you. Uh, 250 crores, is that run rate sustainable? What does it scale to, both on exports and turnkey? Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, uh, the export, uh, uh, we started the year with a balance order book of export of about 450 crores. And this was primarily the past orders which we had got pre-COVID, uh, Sri Lanka and Mozambique. And these were finishing and, and uh, out of that in the two quarters, we've got a revenue of 150 crores, balance about 300 crores remaining. So the aim is to get new export orders which we didn't get in the COVID period. And we are trying to get these orders as soon as possible so that the gap between revenue realization from new export orders and as the current orders finish is minimized to the extent possible. Uh, the uh, shortfall in export in this quarter was made by uh, aggressive, uh, aggressively pursuing our turnkey stream of revenue. And, and that's why you see a healthy growth uh, year on year, H1 to H1, the turnkey has doubled. And even uh, sequentially, there's a healthy growth quarter one to quarter two in the turnkey revenue. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mittal, hi, welcome to the show. I just wanted more uh, of an idea with regards to the tendering pipeline for FI23 and FI24. What can you share with us? And uh, what is the status when it comes to projects such as the smart city as well? Our total order book right now is about 5,000 crores, uh, out of which about 2,400 crores is consultancy, uh, 200 crores is turnkey, uh, 2,000 crores is uh, turnkey, and the balance export order is only about 300 crores. So as we go forward, uh, we will continue to pursue aggressively our export orders so that, as I said, the gap between the current orders and new order realization reduces. Uh, as far as consultancy and turnkey is concerned, we are, uh, you know, uh, 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 keeping a healthy mix of the turnkey and consultancy stream. We have been getting recent orders. We got the Ahmedabad Metro Consultancy Phase 2. Uh, we recently got a good turnkey order of the Bangalore Metro Depot, which is about 250 crores for rights. So a healthy mix between the consultancy stream and the turnkey stream would be there going forward in the the current financial year as well as the coming financial year. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mithal, I wanted to speak to you specifically about consultancy because that's a bigger part of your order book as well. What is the split there in terms of domestic and foreign orders? And you've been looking at increasing the foreign orders as well, right? That's the higher margin business. In times to come, how much can it scale up to? So, uh, international business, as I have been uh, uh, saying in our past interaction, is a key focus area of rights moving forward. 
we launched our rights videsh initiative few quarters back uh, our h1 to h1 comparison saw a growth of about 46% in the international consultancy revenue stream and we have pitched for a number of international consultancy orders across sectors whether it is uh, highways metros uh, rail infra so moving forward i'm sure that this is uh, we are going to surpass our previous year in a big way in the international consultancy area bye can you give us a percentage what was what was it as a percentage of consultancy business last year and how much have you grown how much do you plan to grow it by so our total consultancy uh, revenue of last year was about 900 crores and out of that our international consultancy was about 120 crores moving forward i see already we have done about 76 crores in h1 so moving forward we are definitely going to surpass last year and i see at least a 2x 3x growth in the years coming forward at rights videsh uh, you know branches out into more and more areas and more and more countries and different sectors across countries internationally right uh, you know before we speak about uh, other parts of your business just wanted to understand from a technical standpoint uh, is there any timeline that you've heard from the government with regards to uh, you know the offer for sale for rights i mean have investor road shows begun uh, at at what stage of the offer for sale planning are we right now uh, i think uh, issues and matters related to the ofs uh, the dpam and the ministry would be the right people to comment on the way forward on your rmc business uh, it's about 100 crores annualized order book uh, how much can that scale up to uh, uh, pardon me your rmc business yes that so rmc hmm. RMCL has got a healthy revenue of about uh, 50 plus crores in H1, and and we target at least a, a double digit growth vis-a-vis -vis last year. So we would we are targeting at least 100 plus crores in the way forward. Uh, RMCL is working in the renewable energy area for IR. All uh, renewable en uh, energy initiatives of IR, uh, RMCL is the nodal agency, and and areas of work in. Uh, solar as well as wind energy moving forward are going to see a lot of growth and so ir's uh, uh, initiatives in this area would be piloted by rmcl okay you did have your some receivables outstanding in terms of your exports which were cleared i think just uh, this month worth around 11.4 million dollars what is the total outstanding when do you expect it to be cleared and are receivables improving as a whole Uh, yes in fact that was a very good effort by our team in sri lanka we had an outstanding of about 118 crores which we recently got about 100 crores so uh, 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 most of it we've got we've got some outstanding in uh, mozambique which is also very much in the pipeline we're expecting it by uh, uh, latter part of this month or maybe december so all our international receivables are under control our domestic receivables are a temporary dip in certain clients but uh, not a cause of worry overall there is an improvement in the domestic receivables also except two three clients okay all right mr mithil thanks a lot for joining us and taking us through what the outlook for the business going forward is that's the word coming in from rights receivables are improving and the growth rates looking well good as well especially in the export markets let's do one thing time for a break now on the other side we'll be joined by keshav bhajanga who is the executive director at century plyboards to discuss their quarter two earnings performance Welcome back. Well, let's get talking to another company, Century Plyboard. The stock is down around two odd percent. That's the other company that we're focusing on now. It has seen margins contract in Q2 across segments. This is owing to a sharp increase in raw material costs. Remember, the company had told us earlier that they expect margins to pick up in the second half of the year, and that growth for the full year should top around 15 percent. Keshav Bajanka, who is the executive director at Century Plyboard, jo joins us now to discuss the numbers. Hi, Mr. Bajanka. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time out. You know, the first question has to be on margins. You had guided for some weakness in margins in Q2. Is the worst of the raw material worries over for you? Are all of your high-cost materials exhausted now? Um, so definitely, things do look like they are improving. You know, chemical costs have come down substantially. Having said that, there is still some pressure on timber prices. 
but uh, if we remove the the one time impairment loss that we had in this quarter we've actually been able to do 17.3% of uh, uh, overall ebitda margins which i think is far better than what we had actually expected all right 17.3% if you adjust for the imp- impairment but you uh, you know spoke about timber and phenol can you give us a sense of how they've played out i mean how do they compare with the highs that we saw in the second quarter chemical prices have corrected by more than 10% across all chemicals and certain chemicals like melamine they've corrected by more than 20% uh, but having said that timber prices are still a little volatile yes they have come off slightly recently to you know 3 4% but overall i think uh, definitely going forward we should be able to get uh, better results and i think we'll be able to increase ebitda margins overall Okay, when you talk about an improvement at EBITDA margins, can you give us a number? What kind of margins are you looking at in second half? Q2, we have done 17.3%. Uh, if you adjust for uh, for uh, the impairment, so I, I definitely believe we'll be able to do better than this. All right, uh, you're guided for about 15 to 17% going forward. So let's see how that comes about. But uh, what's the sense of demand on the ground? I mean, a lot of companies are talking about some sort of sluggishness. Can you give us a sense? we had guided for 3500 plus for the current year on a base of 3000 last year um having said that uh, you see we have already grown by close to 17% over last year's base if you just look at uh, the the increase in turnover over the first two quarters so going forward i'm very confident that you know we should at least try to clock in close to double digit growth for h2 uh, if not then at least high single digit growth so overall we should be well uh, well above our estimate of 20% growth for the year okay let's talk about your expansion plans now because you have announced a fair amount of capex in mdf as well could you give us a sense of how mdf prices have been what is the sustainable realization right now and outlook going forward no so i think you're talking about uh, 550 crore capex uh, in uh, chennai that we have announced yesterday that is related to particle board which is a separate product category uh, as compared to mdf currently our uh, particle board capacity is uh, at 100% utilization with very robust ebitda margins and uh, going forward considering that particle board is going to be a strong uh, growth driver for the entire wood panel segment i think that you know uh, it was high time that uh, that we froze on the capacity the delay was actually due to a paucity of land but uh, the government of tamil nadu has been very very supportive and uh, we have purchased the land for our plant now so i think uh, uh, god willing within a couple of years we should be coming up with uh, the the particle board capacity okay all right uh, you know you have referred about um, your market share being around 5 to 6% just wanted to know is there any kind of considerable movement in that uh, i think we have definitely gained market share Uh, the five six percent that you are talking about is in the plywood category, and in the plywood category, um, you know we are twenty five percent plus of the organized market. Now, as the share of the organized is growing, I think that our share will definitely keep increasing. Uh, hopefully, going forward, you will see a substantial uptake in uh, the the market share uh, for century in plywood. Our Myanmar unit, we've already taken uh, impairment on that. Uh, you know the the situation is very challenging in Myanmar at this point in time. Uh, so uh, because we are unable to run the unit, it it at one point was our most profitable unit. But now, considering the the the, the macro scenario in that country, we have taken a decision to dispose of that unit. All right, we take that point. Uh, you will dispose that unit, and it will curtail losses by about five to six crores. on an annual basis for you as well uh, thanks a lot kesha for joining in uh, wish you good luck for the remainder of this year as well we're looking forward to margins expanding and uh, the double digit growth that you're guiding for in the second half uh, take a short break come back we talk about a bunch of stocks which are buzzing around today apollo hospitals and zomato both of them on the back of their numbers Welcome back. Well, let's talk about some news on future retail resolutions. Sources are telling CNBC TV18 that 16 expression of interest have been filed to acquire the company under IBC. Ritu Singh is joining us to jo- give us more details on this one. Ritu, what are you picking up? 
Well, thanks for that. 16 EOIs have been received for future retail under the IBC, out of which one, that is uh, UV Stress Asset Management, has already withdrawn from the race. But there are still 15 players that are in the running, and these include from the likes of Reliance to Adani to some of the lesser known names as well. Reliance's bid is the least surprising, given that it was already in talks with future retail for a potential deal, which of course we know did not eventually materialize. Adani is the surprise entry, which has submitted an EOI through a joint called April Moon Retail Private Limited, which is a JV between Adani Airport Holdings and the promoters of Flamingo Group. Reliance is bid via the Reliance Retail Ventures Limited company. The other players that are in the fray include your Dharampal, Satipal, Shalimar Corporation, which is a real estate builder, uh, WH Smith Travel Limited, Capri Global United Biotech, uh, Nalva Steel and Power Limited, which is uh, OP Jindal Group company, uh, UV Multiple Asset Investment Trust and others. Uh, the important thing to note is that, uh, you know, Many of these are lesser known names, so banks are not uh, expecting all of these to actually come forward and submit binding bids when the time comes. Uh, but remember, in terms of the assets that are still left with future retail, according to EOI documents, it still has about 302, uh, you know, leased retail stores, which includes 30 large format stores like Big Bazaar, etc., and 272 small format stores as well. Uh, there are claims of over 21,400 odd crores from financial creditors alone. Uh, you know, your Bank of India, Union Bank. Of India, Canada, uh, SBI, these are some of the large lenders. So we'll have to see how it proceeds by November 20th is uh, when the shortlist of EOIs is expected. Okay, all right, some movement on the future retail resolution. Thanks, uh, Ritu, for that. But one stock that I'm tracking is Apollo Hospitals. That stock is doing well in today's trading session. That is on the back of its Q2 numbers. Now, uh, revenue is up around 14 odd percent on a year on year basis. The street was anticipating a 6% growth. So that's come in better than expectations. Margins have come in at 13% versus 16.5 odd percent. Street was anticipating around 13.5% in terms of margin. So it's largely in line. You'd have to say and it's flat on a Q on Q basis now one of the reasons why the margins have been pulled down is because of the digital health and pharmacy segment if you just go through their PNL it's an EBIT loss of around 54 crores which is higher on a Q on Q basis now healthcare services which is basically the bread and butter of Apollo hospitals the hospital business revenue is up 5% year on year growth X of vaccination because same time last year they did over 200 crores of vaccination revenue because of COVID is up around 12% overall occupancy has risen to 68% versus 60% Q on Q and the company is guiding to hit 70% in terms of occupancies. Medical tourism currently 7% of sales versus 9% pre-COVID on a blended basis. The metros are higher at around 15%. Company expects medical tourism to probably move to 10% of total sales by the end of this year. Apollo 24-7, everybody wants to know about that digital arm. The EBIT loss was 170 crores as per the management. This is versus 140 40 crores in the previous quarter. Next year, the company said they should be EBITDA neutral. They're seeing 50,000 transactions per day, higher bill value. The comp company is targeting a GMV of around 1,500 crores. We could hear something on fundraising by the end of the year. That's what they've said. And the total investment is around 2,000 crores, which is committed for Apollo 24-7. The company said they are generating enough cash flow to suffice it. And hence, uh, they are quite positive on that. Lastly, Apollo Health and Lifestyle, the diagnostic business along with the clinics, it's up 14% on a year-on-year -year basis and 27% on a Q1Q -Q basis. So that's an Apollo Hospitals doing well in today's mm. trading session. All right, we take that point, Ekta. What's doing well, though, however, are the markets themselves are at the high point of trade. HDFC Twins is doing extremely well. And what's interesting is right now, the global markets have surged as well. Dow Futures at the high point of trade. And we're seeing some weakness in dollar index, incremental weakness. <coughs> in fact, it was at 108. And now it's uh, sub that as well. So we will watch out for the second half in today's trading session. Take a short break, come back, talk about individual stocks. We have a bunch of them buzzing around as well. There you have the dollar index sub that 108 mark. Welcome back. Still tuned into Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18. While the markets are doing well, there are a couple of stocks in the broader markets which are reacting to earnings. So I'm going to be speaking about them today. GNFC and Fine Organic are the two stocks which are in focus. While GNFC is down 10%, Fine Organic is the one which is doing well. So let's start with GNFC because it was a very weak quarter for the company this time around. Revenues were down 4%. 
coming in at 2600 crore rupees however it was ebitda that declined even further down 28 percent at 309 crore rupees margins they declined 900 basis points on a yy basis leading to a profit decline of 16 percent they have two segments fertilizer and the chemical segment so the fertilizer segment did well for the company it was driven by increased volumes this time around however the chemical segment witnessed subdued realizations across the board all their chemical prices were lower sales volumes also were seen low in the chemicals division that is because of an operational outage mainly at that Bharuj complex in the quarter gone by so that is the reason why the stock is lower in trade today on the flip side it was the second consecutive quarter of strong performance from fine organic uh, company has been able to see a top-down beat their gross margins this time around were up 590 basis points on a yy basis uh, but if you look at the revenues they were also up 110 percent EBITDA was up 91 percent and margins expanded 1100 basis points for the company and it has seen a sharp improvement in profitability as well profits are up 73 percent on a yy basis the stock has come off from the highs it was up nine percent at a point in time now it's up four percent but doesn't take away from the fact that the earnings this time around were really strong for the company all right so those are a bunch of stocks which are buzzing around uh, on account of earnings a big slide on gnfc a big up move on fine organics as well what we'll do is take a short break on the other side as always invite manisha gupta to talk about all things commodities and she have with us uh, she has with her uh, stefan rust as well Welcome back. Joining us on the show now is Stephen Rust. He is CEO at Laguna Lab. Stephen, hi. Morning. And uh, what a week this one has been when you look at the global crypto markets. Just when everybody thought that the crypto winter was getting over, you have the biggest crypto slump in this year happening. What is your sense with FTX and what is happening and how uh, soon and what kind of regulations globally are you expecting now? Yeah, thank you, Manisha. Thank you for having me on. Um, look, it's uh, it's been a really tough week, a tough three, four days. But I think this has been building for a couple of weeks with a couple of issues that happened in the marketplace. And I think FTX, which is one of the biggest exchanges, just um, falling, filing for bankruptcy pretty much, right? I mean, Alameda Research is shut down. FTX itself is is illiquid. So I think there's a big difference that we're experiencing right now, illiquid, illiquid markets and then um, basically insolvency. What are, what are we confronted with? I think we don't know. There's a myriad of companies that are set up under the FTX group. How do we manage that? How do we navigate that? Um, you know, he's gone out and apologized, uh, but I think for the crypto markets, it's a big backlash. I mean, a lot of people were trading, a lot of institutions were trading using FTX. Um, they raised a lot of money in equity, so we'll see how much of the equity was used, how much of the customer funds potentially were used. Um, you know, we, we still don't know. The fallout is so big, and there's going to be a lot of repercussions um, totally. throughout the thing. But Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, you know, I, since then, in the last 24 hours, we've seen 9 to 10 global exchanges actually come out and announce that they will be publishing now uh, the proof of funds or proof of reserves. <laughs> How will that help? Yes. So that'll be really helpful, right? I mean, on the one hand, it's really good. We see what the collateral is, where those collaterals reside, which wallet addresses they are, and what's the full uh, extent of that. I think what we also then need to do is see proof of liabilities, because in the end, what are the liabilities associated with the counter assets that are having? You know, in a DeFi world, if they were fully decentralized, you'd have all all of that there. You know, we work with, and Chainlink Labs, uh, a big partner of ours, um, they have an on-chain proof of reserve, independent, verifiable, real-time. You can see that at any point in time, what the reserves are of any lending protocol, um, particularly if it's cross-chain, that's when it matters. Clearly. Stephen, also, uh, you know, there have been a lot of regulatory statements, if not actions, that have been announced or being spoken about from U.S. to even Japan and Bahamas, for that matter. Do you think this would, in some sense, trigger more compliance, more auditions, more regulations, if, 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 we, if the world were to look at it? In a centralized world, and all of these entities that have come down in the last, sort of, this year, particularly, they've all been centralized entities. These have been 
Um, to a certain extent, regulated. Uh, they have had regulated or licensed individuals working there. They mm -hmm. have had compliance officers. They have followed sort of pretty much the rule um, as set forth by a lot of these regulators. Um, and I think, you know, they, they will have a deeper look into how they are managed. We've had much bigger crashes in centralized traditional finance and regulated industries to the extent where governments have had to come and print trillions of dollars to help bail them out. In this case, in crypto land, there's no bailout. Nobody comes. It's another private entity that may come and try and look and evaluate a rescue plan. But in this case, it hasn't happened. In a DeFi world, you know, it is already much more transparent than you get in a centralized or traditional finance world. Mm -hmm. So the DeFi, the decentralized world, I think, you know, um, should be, we should have more um, oversight in terms of auditing capability, tracking, checking the blockchain explorers, uh, looking at the transactions that take place, identifying the addresses that funds move to. But I don't think we need more regulation in the decentralized world. However, in the centralized world, um, I don't know. I don't know what to do with there. I think it's very complex um, and it's very hard to navigate. I think people just get uh, lured by the vast amounts of money that are there. And, and as oh, yeah. a result, they become maybe... Yeah. Oh, yes. Stephen, you know, uh, the, the whole, uh, you know, idea of perhaps decentralization and uh, crypto and blockchain was to ensure that there was more transparency, that you could perhaps get away from all of these things. And this is exactly what we have seen happen. I also want to come to the point about the kind of sell-off that we have seen in cryptocurrencies. Solana, for an example, I mean, that was a very strong one that also has seen a very sharp decline. Where do you see light at the end of the tunnel now? So I was I was at the Solana breakpoint in Portugal, where just last weekend, over the weekend, by the way, people were building. There were developers, there were business developers, there were software developers, all kinds of developers trying to grow the ecosystem. And that ecosystem was really strong. There were some 10, 15,000 people that flew from around the world to go to the Solana breakpoint and identify new business opportunities, build commercial relationships. Um, and that was, to me, a very good sign that Solana is still a strong platform, has a very strong proposition. It's just unfortunate that a lot of the token holders in Solana were using the Solana tokens as collateral and had to offload those to readjust their, you know, sort of funding requirements or their customers' funds to be able to allow them to withdraw. And that was FTX and Alameda was one of the biggest backers of Solana. Solana, I think, is, is going to be here to stay. I think other crypto assets that have developer communities that are providing valuable propositions are going to be here to stay. And it's your keys, your coins. And I think that's what we're going to be looking for going forward. All right. Tough time. And what a whole week can really do a complete yep. change in what we've seen in the international market. But Stephen, thank you so much for joining us and making it easier, breaking it down for our, uh, for our viewers here. With that, that's all the time that we have on Halftime Report. Stay tuned for Business Lunch coming up next.